you went up in five, four, three, two, one. Hi everybody, this video is about the second test flight of my actively controlled model rocket Diamond X. Its first test flight is very successful, and I have a dedicated video about it on my channel. I'd recommend watching that one first if you're new to this project, and in this video we're going to talk about some modifications that have been made to the rocket, and then watch the footage of its second test flight. Just to recap, Diamond X is about 1 meter long and about 1 kilo in weight, and it has 4 actively controlled aft fins. The rocket is now in what I'm calling the Block 2 configuration. So let's take a look at the changes that have been made since the first test flight. So here we have Diamond X as it's getting prepared for its second test flight. Aft of about here, there are very little changes. This new raceway has been installed. You can see that there's a connector there for a booster. I'm just checking this out to make sure that it doesn't affect the vehicle aerodynamically. Not really on there very straight, but it's where the holes lined it up as. In the nose, there's been a little modification, I'm sure you guys can tell. We have a camera in the nose now. So let's take this piece off. This is the new Aero Shroud. And the Aero Shroud had to be modified with a camera dome on it. So Flight 1 flew with this front Aero Shroud with a pointy tip, rounded tip now. Let's take this guy off and see what has changed under the hood. So this is the avionics assembly of Diamond X. I didn't really show this off very much in the intro video, so I'll go into a little bit of detail as to what's going on up here. Let's start off on this side here. You see lots of cabling going on. The first thing to note are these two circuit boards right here. So this circuit board is the primary flight computer, and this one back here is the power distribution system. The primary flight computer has a massive IC right in the middle there, this big chip in the middle is the actual flight computer itself, the microcontroller. And then around the periphery here, we have lots of different sensors, so inertial measurement units and uh, barometric pressure sensors, magnetometers. On this side, we have our micro SD card. This holds our flight data and the USB port we use to program the system. On this side, here's our ribbon cable that goes from the primary flight computer to the power distribution system. And finally, we have servo outputs and other power outputs um, that go down the raceway towards the tail fins. The changes that have been made, here's the old battery mount. You can see that we've just modified it with a camera and the camera control board. These are just run cam, these are split HDs. Um, a new power connector here to take data to it. Hello, Mr. Momo. Now I wanna uh, very explicitly cover one thing really quickly. This is not a seeker. This is just a camera that looks forward and records the data. So there is no passing of data between this camera system and the flight computer. You can see there are two wires that connect the camera to the flight computer. There are these ones, five volts is red and black is ground. So the, the primary flight computer has no way of seeing any of the data that this camera records. It just goes to this little micro SD card on board. So it may look like this thing has a seeker now because there's a camera, it absolutely does not and you probably shouldn't develop such a system. In my country, that's illegal, and it's probably illegal in yours. So when it comes ready to fly this thing, everything will already be set up. We'll already have parachutes packed, um, pyro charge installed, not run down uh, inside the vehicle. Everything will be all set, except for plugging in these XT30 connectors right here. That connects the main battery to the flight computer. And then the last thing we have to do is slide this aero cover on. And then all the setup, including calibrating the inertial measurement system, uh, turning cameras on, servos, everything like that, is all controlled via the telemetry link, so I can control that from the ground station, which is super helpful. So in theory, this is a very quick setup system. I just plug the battery in, put this guy in place, four screws are ready to go. In practice, typically some part of that process goes wrong and I have to take the whole thing apart. But we'll try tomorrow and see if this guy is easy to put together. That was one of its primary design goals, is to make it not super annoying to fly. So let's talk about Flight Test 2's guidance system. This time we're executing a pitch program. 
So at liftoff, we're going to try to point straight up. At three seconds, we're going to pitch down to 20 degrees below the horizon. And then at five seconds, point straight back up. And hopefully we're traveling vertical when our parachute deploys. The plot in the top right is a MATLAB simulation of this. And we'll compare this to flight data after the flight. We're also going to be launching from the Atlas silo. This is a hot launch silo that I talked about more in the first video on Diamond X. Hot launch means that the main rocket motor is ignited inside of the silo. And in this case, the rocket is held in place by pairs of aluminum rails sandwiching each fin. A flame diverter is located at the base of the silo made of ceramic tiles, and this redirects the rocket's hot exhaust gases up a separate channel. So we should see our hot exhaust exiting out of the right channel and then our rocket out of the left. So let's watch the flight footage. Going up, going up in five, four, three, two, one. The flight went great. We got a good parachute deployment. There's the parachute deployment charge and it did go off. Only damage was one broken fin, but that honestly might not be a bad thing because it's better the fin breaks than the really expensive fin and motor mount. And the only other piece that was damaged was a little crack on this raceway here. I'm not quite sure why this one broke. I imagine either one of the parachute lines or something grabbed the end of that screw and tried to tear it out the front of the rocket as the parachute deployed because these screws they don't like end in the paper they actually go through a little bit so it's kind of a snag hazard maybe not a great design but we'll pull the flight video off and pull the flight data off and see how it looked okay so i've uploaded the flight data here to curve and i wanted to walk you through some of the plots that i found interesting so the first one here is the pitch of the rocket in green and the pitch set point in orange so we can see here that the, at the beginning, this is as the rocket leaves the rail, the pitch is pretty unstable. This is when the rocket is rolling uncontrollably and our control system hasn't turned on yet. So it turns on about here, and then we can see we quickly arrest that rolling and then start to control our pitch. And we start to bring our pitch steadily down, down, down towards our set point of zero degrees. Zero degrees in this case being vertical, just based on the coordinate system that I use. At three seconds in a flight, that set point changes to 20 degrees and our rocket starts to bring the pitch back up to 20 degrees. So this is pulling the nose below vertical to 20 degrees. And we get to about 18 degrees before our set point changes again at five seconds into flight. At five seconds, we rapidly bring that pitch back down and we're slowly bringing it back down to zero. And we get to about one degree here and our parachutes deploy right about here. So in terms of pitch, our rocket was pretty well controlled. This next plot shows pitch and yaw. So this is the same profile in orange as we saw in green above. And the green line here is our yaw. And the interesting thing here is that our yaw should be going to zero, and it's pretty close, but it isn't quite at zero. We have this kind of bias at about negative five or negative six degrees for the duration of the flight, which is pretty interesting. I'm not quite sure why this happened. Could be an aerodynamic thing or a control thing. I'm not quite sure, but I'll look into that. This next plot shows our fin angles. So you can see at the beginning here, our fins are set to zero degrees, which is just pointing straight up wherever I calibrated them. 
and then right here is where the control system enables, and that corresponds to chaotic motion here, there's no fin motion, and then our system starts to control itself, and then our fins start to move around a bunch. You can see right here, our fins kind of go nuts, there's lots of oscillatory behavior here. That corresponds to the second pitch set point change. And I'm not quite sure why this happened. This is another thing that I'm gonna look into, but we induced a lot of oscillation on our fins. So then I was like, okay, which axis is causing these fins to oscillate? And most of it is occurring because of roll. So this is the roll axis command. So our fins uh, receive a command to control pitch and yaw and roll, and we can see each of these separately. So we can see that in roll, our fins are starting to kind of go nuts right at this time. The other thing to note here is this section. We see that our fins are commanding a roll of about negative 0.8 or negative one degrees. So this is the roll bias detection. So I can never get the fins quite straight when I calibrate them on the ground. So the rocket has to detect the roll offsets, how, you know, how far off I've calibrated the fins and then has to correct for it. And you can see in this case, I was about 0.8 degrees off in calibrating the fins. Which isn't, which isn't bad, it detected it pretty quickly, but um, next time I can calibrate the fins a little bit you know, further towards that side, and then in theory, uh, I can reduce this offset. I can also look at the pitch and yaw commands data. We can see here the yaw deflection in orange. It looks like we're trying to correct for that yaw bias, but it, it isn't really doing a whole lot. And then in pitch here, we are trying harder and harder and harder to, to correct for pitch, and this corresponds to a greater difference between our pitch and its set point compared to our yaw and its set point. Now this one is interesting. So this is a torque-based controller, and we can compare the pitch commands torque in green to the acceleration we see on the pitch axis. So this is getting kind of nuanced, but if we want to do acceleration control, I need to be able to tell the rocket, hey, I'd like you to pull 1G on the pitch axis, and then have it achieve that by moving the fins a certain amount. And this data here, I haven't actually you know, parsed through it at all, but this data will be really useful in trying to correlate a certain amount of fin deflection to a certain amount of acceleration generated on the rocket. So this will be useful in analysis later, but I did collect this data, and so it'll be helpful later on. Lastly here, we have our roll angle. Our roll set point for this entire flight was zero degrees. If you watched the Flight Test 1 video, you saw that we had a, a roll program, so we rolled to the left 45 degrees and then back to the right. This rocket, it was supposed to go to zero, and we can see that we had a little bit of a pitch bias, or sorry, correction, a roll bias, um, as soon as the control system enabled, but we steadily brought that back down to zero. And then this oscillation here, again, corresponds to that second pitch set point change. So there's some problem in the control system that's causing the vehicle to roll whenever I try to change its pitch. This could be a number of things, we're still working through it, um, but we can see that oscillatory behavior in roll that we saw on the fins there. So overall, collected a bunch of great data here. Particularly, this data will help me um, work through the acceleration control problems I've been having in simulations. Um, but in theory, this rocket's only going to get better with time as we collect more data and we refine the simulation models so that I can do a bunch of test flights on the ground and then go out and fly it, and hopefully the two match up pretty well. So now let's actually compare the MATLAB model that I have to our actual flight data. So the plot on top is the MATLAB model where I started at about a 50 degree pitch angle, kind of like um, the rocket was at when its control system enabled. And then the plot on bottom is that same pitch profile data from the actual flight itself. So if my MATLAB model is 100% accurate, then these two should basically line up one for one. The things that I'm looking at are one, the slope of the lines when it's trying to change its pitch, and then two, the behavior of the rocket after these step responses, so after the set point changes. And overall, these are pretty good. The slopes are almost identical, and we can see basically the same behavior of the rocket. There's an underdamped response as we change that pitch set point. They're not identical though, so there's a couple changes that I need to make to my MATLAB model to have it more accurately represent the flight data that I have. So the first thing that I'm noticing is that the MATLAB model has more oscillations in pitch than the actual flight data. So this is showing that the rocket itself has a higher damping ratio than the model would suggest. Uh, right now, my model doesn't actually give the rocket any natural damping, and it should have a little bit. So I'll add that and then try to kind of pick some coefficients so that the model lines up with the flight data more accurately. The second thing that I'm noticing is after the second pitch set point change, the rocket changes its attitude much quicker. So that initial pull up after we change our set point back down to zero gets us pretty close to zero in flight. 
but it only gets us to about eight degrees in the uh, the simulation. So there's something else that's wrong. It could be the mass moment of inertia is incorrect, or it could be that the rocket in flight is actually less stable than uh, the model would suggest. And there's a couple of reasons I think that might be. So I'll continue to tweak this model and every single flight, I will compare the model data to the flight data. And so hopefully I can get a really, really accurate simulation. And if I have an accurate simulation, then it's really easy to kind of test the rocket on the ground and I don't have to spend time and money burning rocket motors to go test the rocket. So what's coming up next? As I talked about in the first Diamond X video, I've been working on a series of boosters that can fly with this rocket. The first one with a fixed 38 millimeter motor is, is pretty close to being done. I'm a little concerned to fly it because this rocket doesn't have a dual deploy system. And even on this flight, you know, a one stage flight, it landed pretty far from the launch site. So I'm a little concerned to fly it with a booster where it flies even higher and then it lands even further away. So maybe I just limit those flights to low wind days or I work on some other system of having the rocket fly upwind. Not quite sure yet, but flying it with a booster would give me more flight time so I could collect better and more accurate flight data. The second thing that I'm doing is I'm still working on that acceleration control piece that I talked about when we looked at the curve data. Acceleration control is very difficult to test on the ground because it relies on feedback from the rocket itself. So I can't you know, pick the rocket up and kind of simulate the accelerations. So I need to work on a system where inside of the flight software, when we're simulating on the ground, the rocket kind of computes the accelerations it should be seeing and then you know, applies those after the fact and that way the rocket can kind of internally test itself. So that's you know, hardware in the loop simulation. Now the silo itself has definitely seen better days. As you can see in this clip, the pressure that built up inside of the main silo was so high that it burst the inner wall of the silo. And then that wall hit the outer wall of the flame trench and broke both of them. And they were only held in place because there were some screws holding them in at the top. So that is one of the reasons we didn't see a ton of exhaust gases coming out of the flame trench because it just blew out the side of the silo. That probably helped the rocket a little bit, but it didn't look as cool. Um, and that also means that the silo in this case is basically unflyable at this point. I would need to rebuild and frankly redesign parts of it to strengthen it against the pressures that built up. Um, but for the meantime, I'm just gonna fly this thing off of a rail. It's way easier and I can still collect uh, all of the flight data that I need doing that. In terms of videos, the next one that's gonna release after this will be a Diamond X build video. So I've recorded a bunch of footage of me building a second Diamond X and upgrading it to a Block 3 standard where I can fly with a booster. I've got a ton of great footage there, so I'm hoping you guys will enjoy that. I also talked about a shock deep dive video that I've been working on. Uh, before I finished that one up, I wanted to fly shock on a sixth test flight, and I did, and it didn't go very well, so the rocket's dead. So I'm gonna incorporate some of that footage into the video and then release that um, you know, coming up a little bit later. And instead of being kind of the culmination of a successful test program, I'll just talk about the lessons that I learned in that. And hopefully you guys don't have to relearn all of those lessons yourself if you want to get into actively controlled model rockets. Well, that's all I have for now. Thank you everybody who's been interested in the project and followed along so far. We've got lots of interesting stuff coming up, so stay tuned for more.